But when I brought Major Chong to, I was pretty keen to um, get into swords and do a bit of it ourselves. And uh, the first broadbill we caught was fishing at night time on the drift, which was, uh, most of the fishing was done then. And we got uh, my first wife. Uh, I'm very good with wives. I, I, I've donated quite a couple, of, quite a few houses in Russell to wives. Still got the boat. <coughs> the wives are very handy for catching broadbill because they clean up after themselves as well. So it's quite useful. Anyway, she caught a fish that's 260 odd kilos, which is a sort of New Zealand woman's record on 37. She got the old man of the sea award for that. But uh, <coughs> over the next few trips we did, next few uh, attempts we did, started to get some information coming through about what was happening overseas. And we had a couple of deckhands. The Lytton boys were uh, fishing out of Venezuela as deckhands in Venezuela. And they came back with these stories of going out in the daytime and after they'd caught a, uh, a white marlin, a blue marlin, and a tuna, they'd have a go for a, uh, a broadbill during the day. And that's sort of, he just pricked up at that. And we got a few clues about what, what they were doing in Venezuela at the time. So we went out and we, we, we started to try and uh, work out if we could come out here and catch them during the daytime as well. Now, broadbill we get here, uh, we're in a different phase than they are in the other areas where daytime broadbill fishing occurs in any great numbers. And in Venezuela and Miami, they're really in, in tropical areas, and they've got a lot of small fish, they're in breeding areas, uh, the fish are not necessarily as deep. Uh, in, in, in Venezuela, the fish, they, the patch they've got there, they're feeding on a mound on the bottom, and they're dropping their baits right to the bottom. Uh, in, in Florida, they're fishing in big current areas, they're using what's almost like a, a modified ledge rig, so as they drop it down, the current keeps the bait out to one side. And uh, that, that was never going to work particularly well in our situation. But we knew that the, we had broadbill out here. We didn't know whether we could catch them in New Zealand using that method. But the, the broadbill seemed to have two, two distinct lifestyles when they come off our coast. And the first is, as we see it on swords, when they're fishing up on the green banks. And, and on the warm side, the temperature breaks, where there's food, accumulations of swords at night time come up and down the thermocline come up and down the, the water level feeding on the uh, um, the coral layer and uh, it seems that in New Zealand when those fish hit areas where there's a lot of food such as in our case where we fish mostly the garden patch and they find there's big schools of blue nose they'll take up station in those areas and rather than carry on that habit of going up and down from several hundred metres to the surface feeding on squid and other stuff and those temperature breaks, they'll take up station and they start feeding on the schools of blue nose. A lot of the clues for that came from um, evidence of the guys who were catching blue nose off their garden patch for a uh, Mongoli fish shop and they were getting the, uh, the blue nose coming up with big slashes on the side. So it's pretty obvious there was some action coming from Bruno, uh, from uh, Broadbill in that area. <clears throat> the other thing about the Broadbill is that he can go up and he can go down probably faster than any other fish we know. But they do thermoregulate, but they keep their brains warm from a muscle in their eye. So the rest of the body can get quite cold, but they keep their brains warm, so they're active and they know what's going on even when they get down to depth. And when we talk about going down to depths, we, we, we know from the tagging process that's gone on with Broadbill here that they're going down to 750 metres. But when they dropped Alvin, which is the, one of the American submersibles, down to 2,000 metres, they had a problem with Alvin when it got to 2,000 metres. When they pulled Alvin up, the semi-submersible, the submersible, from 2,000 metres, they found there was a Broadbill lodged in the side of it. It actually attacked Alvin and got its bill clean in the seals. When they pulled Alvin up, they got themselves a free broad bill as well. So here's a, here's a broad bill way down at 2,000 metres. The next question was, why are they down that deep? Why are they always going so deep? Why do they spend their daytime hours at 
500, 600, 700 meters. And this is not just when they're feeding in, in, in our region on, on Bruno's and other things. This is during the daytime, they go right down and they'll stay in that area. They're physiologically adapted to being down there, big eyes, keep the head warm. My suspicion is that it's because the, their greatest enemy in the sea is the Marco shark. And you all heard stories of, uh, you know, if you find a broadbill without a tail on the surface, grab a slab and hang around the area and you'll catch the biggest marker you've ever caught. And that's, um, that's probably their biggest enemy, but because the marker is a, a mostly a sight feeder. When it's, it'll detect by smell, but when it feeds it's doing it by sight. If they're way down in that deep dark water, they're probably in areas um, where they've got better protection from, uh, from Marcos. So putting all this together, working out systems, how we do things, and uh, we made some glorious cock-ups to begin with, uh, full wire traces, everything spinning, we come up with a hornet's nest of wire and sinkers and other things. And we gradually got round to a system, uh, we, we hand around those, those sheets now? I better grab one for myself so I know what I'm talking about. <coughs> we, grab, uh, we, we eventually came to a system that you see down here. And everything's there for a reason. The lengths are there for a reason. And perhaps the, the easiest way for me to go through it is to start at the bottom and we'll work our way to the top. Now the 32 ounce, what, what we were operating here is a system where we can break off the sinker. If you really have to go and buy half hook of sink, 32 ounce half hook of sinkers, you know why we're looking something a hell of a lot cheaper when you're making a sacrifice sinker. So what we found was this guy here, filled up with stones, weighs about 32 ounces. You want it to sink? Put that in the water as it goes straight down. Bit difficult to pull up when you're half of the fishing because there's a bit of water resistance. But that's going down to the bottom. Going down. And as it goes down, it takes our bait with it. Now, what you can't see, this is a 3 kg line I was talking about here. Just here we've got a joint, a 3 kg line. And three kg line, threaded up through the nose onto the J book. The theory then is when the broad bill comes in and slashes it, he hits or disrupts the three kg line. Mostly it'll break down here at that join. And we're left with a little bit of line here that's neither here nor there, and and the bait dangling free. Now almost invariably broad bill will come in and use the sword as a weapon. The male may not use the sword as a weapon very much, or if at all, but the broad bill always uses a sword. If he's in a school of squid, goes through, slashes up all the squid, comes around and feeds up afterwards. If he's in amongst the fish, he goes in, slashes the fish, comes back and feeds up afterwards. So as he once he slashed this, the sink is gone, it starts to float up a little bit, float around a little bit and then the bait's sitting free, and then he's in a position where he can swallow it without any impediment. If we had a long piece of nylon here, the 3 kg, a long piece of nylon out there that broke off with a long piece of nylon, my worry is that that piece of nylon then acts as deterrent or a, a impediment to swallowing it freely. And when you're using a hook that size, I'll get to the hook soon, you want to make sure that you swallow that hook right down. You've got to remember we're fishing at 500 metres, and it's, unless you're using braid and not fishing IGFA rules, it's extremely hard to set a hook at 500 metres. So we really want these fish to hook up themselves. <coughs> so after he's done that, he come in and he swallowed, and he's take the bait right down, and what we're looking for there's a hook up either in the back of the throat or as far down the stomach as possible. And uh, if you're really lucky, like John was when he beat out a world record for that 404 kilo fish this year, 
you get one that swallows it right down, hooks himself in the heart and gives himself up in an hour's time. It's much better than playing one for 14 hours. <coughs> you know, sometimes you're lucky and sometimes you're not. Now the reason for using the 16 bar row is just because it's, it's got a big, big bite on it when you're not, uh, when you're not being able to strike. When you buy those 16 bar rows, make sure you file them down. They're not very sharp when you get them. So you file them down, get them to a sharp point, and then I always use black felt tip pen on the tip because they're not stainless. Use a black felt tip pen. And if you put the black felt tip over the point of the hook, you'll keep it sharp. It won't, uh, won't deteriorate in the soggy water. The other reason for using the 16 bar row is that while we uh, are always trying to get the hook right down and get a, a, a throw hook, almost 50% of the fish we catch are foul hooked. So if we're using a 16 bar row and we're going to foul hook a fish, we're going to take a bigger bite with the hook into the fish and let perhaps less chance of it uh, getting away. That first fish we caught, 263 kilos from my first wife, foul hooked in the pectoral fin. That other fish foul hooked in the eye. That fish that are wrapped around their bill, got a couple of half hitches, right around both bills, couldn't move, got the fish to the boat in 10 minutes because it couldn't move its bottom jaw. That other fish completely noosed around, come in, slashed the bait, got right around the girth of the fish, hooked itself back up on the trace, lassoed the fish and pulled it in with the lasso. So they, 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 because they're slashing at those baits and they're down there, they're extremely clumsy. The thing with a 16 bar row is, if you've got a clumsy fish, you've got a better chance of it uh, sticking on. So the leader up to the, uh, in the first part of the leader, and you see on your sheet there, it's either 400 pound fluorocarbon or 400 pound wire. When we started off, we'd be using totally wire traces, which is what everybody did in those days. But I got really paranoid about using uh, 30 feet of wire and having wire hanging around the deck. So we started to use, uh, even before wind ons, we started to use uh, a wire tippet of uh, 10 feet. And, uh, and a big swivel in the middle and, uh, and, and nylon for the rest of the trace. So it wasn't much of a, uh, wasn't much of a change for us when we started to get wind-on leaders and really superior swivels available with the advent of wind-on leaders um, to put, uh, to use that system there. And of course the fluorocarbon, 10 feet of fluor 400 pound fluorocarbon is a hell of a lot cheaper than 30 feet of uh, 400 pound fluorocarbon, if you can get it. <clears throat> On here, we've got enough, got 12 ounces of sinkers here, and the idea here is that when that, when this gets hit, when the bait gets hit and your breakaway sinker comes off, you've still got 12 ounces holding the rig down in the current, so that when the fish comes back, the bait hasn't moved too far. If you're fishing in a low current and you knock that sinker off, your bait will just go flying and you might take away out of the area that the uh, broad bill is even in. So by keeping a bit of extra weight at this end, you've got a chance of that bait rig staying in the same sort of area. As I said, the swivel, an extremely strong swivel. In this case, in my case, I use the Yozuri size 9. Um, we played the world record with 369, 14 and a half hours, no, not a problem. And uh, that was with, uh, what, 19 kgs of drag up in the, the last uh, five hours of that fight, and uh, no, no problems there. And we've never had, a, never had one of these give way even when we're tracing fish on a wind-on. If, if you trace fish with a wind-on and had an um, inferior swivel there, you know, what I, you know the frustration that's involved when your swivel gives way at the end of the wind on it. Okay, then we've got to get to our light sticks. I've got to say we've used all sorts of light sticks. We've come back to silent sticks. We got from the States these guys here. They're really fresh. 
really nice, very pretty when, they, when I get it to work. They're water activated, don't need any batteries compared to some of the other ones that are around. The beautiful purple light, and we used them this year. We foul hooked two fish, they got off. We had other shots, but it was obvious that the broad bull had come in and had been so focused on the bloody light that it forgot to have a go at the bait. So they've gone out, we, we now use them as adornments for the dog collar. So every time it rains, I know where my dog is. <laughs> Sometimes flash is not the best. And we've gone, we've gone back to good old silent sticks. Now when we're dropping down to 500 metres, you will get the, some batches of silent sticks are better than others, you will get them break. We found the, the easiest way is if you're, gonna, if you're in a batch where you've got the odd one breaking, just tie two on. And then we come up to our wind on leader. I've gone exclusively to wind ons. That started with my second wife as my deckhand. And uh, because I had to trace all the fish and she was only a tiny little thing, uh, it was much easier to have wind ons and be able to bring the, the fish really close to the boat while the angler's in the chair. And I just stuck with wind ons. I know a lot of my mates have gone back to. Um, 30 foot full, full length rigs. Um, the other thing that attracts me, the wind ons, is the fact that when I go to re rig a lure, I only have to use about uh, 6 feet of trace. I don't have to use uh, 30 feet of trace. That's always an attraction. Okay, then we're coming up to our line, our main line. <coughs> I use, uh, as I said before, we're using uh, 37 kg fluorocarbon, uh, 37 kg fluoro line just because we can see it um, in the dark as we get older. If Sportfish Council made braid acceptable, if we could get 37, if we could get 37 kg braid that tested at 37 and 60 kg braid where we had uh, testers around the country that could actually test it, which we haven't got at the moment, I'd go to braid. The, uh, uh, the response uh, is much better. Uh, but of course the problem we've got is that uh, the breaking strength of the braid is extremely unreliable and the Sportfish Council quite rightly says that uh, for, for comparison for uh, awards it's too hard to, um, uh, to use braid and, and get an equal comparison. Plus uh, the fact that uh, it's very hard and very expensive to get um, 60 kg line tested in this country at the moment. I think most of us all have testers that go to uh, 50 kg rather than 60. All right, so then on the main line, two ways of knowing your way, your way down at 500 metres. We've actually got a, a score we put on uh, two metres at a time, do 50 revolutions, put a black mark on the line. Go another 50, go 25 revolutions, put a red mark on the line. Go 50, to another 25 revolutions, put two black marks on the line. So what we're doing is marking two black marks for 100 metres, sorry, two black marks for 200 metres, and one black mark for 100 metres, and we go all the way up to 700 metres. And that way, and with 50, uh, 50 metre intervals, we know within, within Kui where we are um, when we're dropping the lines down. Because with this rig, we're not dropping it right to the bottom, we're dropping it to the vicinity of the bottom. Our ideal is to keep about 20 metres off the bottom. Now some, some, some guys are using an oxen, um, which is what they do in Venezuela as well, of having the breakaway, dropping it down, dropping it right to the bottom, and then breaking it off on the bottom and letting the bait slowly come up. Um, and that works great. The thing I like about the system we've got here is that if, if nothing attacks it and it's still floating along and I can see nothing's attacked it, I can leave that bait down there with, for uh, one and a half, two hours without the hassle of, of winding it all the way up and putting it all the way back down again. Because those of you who've been at half the floor of blue nose fishing in 500 metres will know that it's not a hell of a lot of fun pulling 500 metres of line up for nothing all the time. And then once we get uh, once we got down to our required depth, if we're fishing at 500 metres, I'm probably trying to estimate that I've got uh, 480 metres of line out. We put our float on, 
very high technology again, six rubber bands, switch them to your line, and then put them up over the float. That will hold up in the water with that weight on, that holds that to that level. So you've got the red one sitting up above the surface, and we're bumping along like this, nothing's happening. And all of a sudden it goes, and it comes up to about this level. All right, something's got the sinker. Something's knocked the sinker off. And then, two things will happen. It'll either start to go down, or else it'll begin to disappear, or else it'll just float up on the surface. Nothing's happening. But what's actually happening is, this broad ball has started to swim up. And that is the most peculiar aspect of fishing for these guys this method, with these methods, this daytime method, when you hook up, the fish comes to the surface faster than you can wind the line. We've had, uh, we've been winding in the line, we know we're, we're now hooked up, we know how to strike, we've got loose line, and the, uh, <clears throat> the bullshit birds are starting to accumulate <clears throat> in an area out about 500 metres away from us. And what's happened is the broad ball's come up to the surface, thrown its gut, with all this fish is in the water, the broad ball's starting to go back down again while we're still pulling up. So here's a, here's a, here's a broad ball, it's taken the bait, come up to the surface within about three minutes, four minutes, and starting to go back down again. The great thing about this system is, you'll see broad ball jumping, they'll come up, from 500 metres and they'll jump. You've got no bloody control over what they're doing. They won't all jump, obviously. You've got no control over what they're doing, but they'll come up and they'll jump. So the, the trick then, of course, is if you know that's happening, you're not keeping up, just start moving ahead, moving ahead, moving ahead, and hope that hope the broad bull's not going to jump in front of you somewhere. Um, so if you all want to ask me questions, that's fine. That's uh, I won't have covered everything. <coughs> so we hooked up on our broad ball. We've got it up. We, 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 we've been up and it's starting to go back down again. When we go to play the broad ball, the thing, important thing to remember is this guy's as comfortable going up that way and going down that way as he is going that way. And most of your fight is going to be with the broad ball either trying to get back down to depth to escape the problem he's got on the surface, or coming up to the surface to escape the problem he's got at depth. He's using the physiological adaptations he's got, which give him an advantage, which is to change depth very quickly, so other fish can't and other predators can't chase him. He's coming up and he's going down. It's not often, it will happen, but it's not often you get a broad ball on the surface and you'll scream like a blue marlin or a striped marlin and go out, to, go out just keep on screaming. If he does that, it's most likely it's not a broad ball. They'll scream out for 100 metres and then they'll start to go down. They like to go back down to the depth. <coughs> and you might find with a big fish, they have to just keep that in mind. Don't put too much pressure on, don't wear your foot anger out, don't go full. full Pulling, gate, pulling on the fish saves your angler because you could be in for a fight of up to 14, 15 and we've had stories of guys going 20 hours. <coughs> so remember that you could be in for a long fight. Don't put all your energy into the front end of the fight. Once you settle down on the fish, just think, think it's a big kingfish. He's going, by this time he's settled down He's going along like this. He's got big pectoral pins out like this. He's got his nose down, big broad bill going out that way. And he's tucking away, trying to go down. You're pulling him up this way, trying to pull him up. And you really just keep on leading the fish, leading the fish, leading the fish. He'll take a bit of a run away. He'll come up, he'll go back down. But it basically, you're just pulling the fish along like you're leading a kingfish. Gets a bit boring, gets a bit monotonous. Go around the circle, break the angle on him go around another circle, bring the angle on him another way. Uh, if it just seems like he's stationary, 
just playing like a dead nala. Put the drag up, start just nose away quietly, increase the angle on them. I say him, but of course, as with all these fish, all the big ones are females. The males are all the small ones. And uh, the next important thing, I guess, is when you get this fish close to the boat, remember that he's most likely, unless he's tangled up some way, he's most likely coming in like this. So when you let the pressure off and he goes forward, you come onto the boat. You've heard about broad bull charging the boat. They're not scared of the boat. They've been scared of Alvin. They're not scared of your boat. But they, you hear about them charging the boat, Quite often that's because when you let the pressure off and you're going forward, you let the pressure off, he's, he's coming back forward onto your boat. So keep, always keep the nose going forward. You're playing a big kingfish, you're playing a big yellowfin, you're playing a big tuna. Keep that uh, nose going forward. And then you'll find in the last bit, they're really, really hard to give up the last bit. Don't be scared to put the drag up. At this stage, the, the, the broadbill's not going to take a big screaming run on you. You might go 50, 60 metres. Most unlikely you'll go to take a big long run. Um, when we when we caught Jerry's world record, um, we had 19 kgs of drag on the reel uh, for the last five hours of the fight. And in the end, uh, by by keeping that pressure up, in the end, we just popped the, the broadbill up to the surface. He just floated, and all we had to do was to uh, um, pull him to the boat and uh, and get a gap in him. Unfortunately, at that stage, it woke up again. But uh, that's another story. But, um, I'm sure you've got heaps of questions. I'll try not to go on too long about that sort of that interests me, but I'm really, really happy to uh, answer any questions you've got and uh, uh, make any clarifications where I may have made things more cloudy than clear. And uh, we've made up a couple of rigs here. Um, Afterwards, you're quite welcome to come up and have a look at how we've done the rigs. You know, we managed to buy, get to go and buy a new hay. Perhaps the other thing I can say is the alternate rig. I forgot all about that. <clears throat> I fish, I fish two lines at a time. I, most, I know most guys are only fishing one line at a time, but I get a bit impatient. The step of this rig. <clears throat> I've got that float bobbing along, nothing's happening. We can, we can try and make something happen. So what we had is our, before we went to this rig here, uh, the rig we had before that was ten of fish on there. We've got that fish on there. And we've got a six ounce or two four ounce sinkers off the front of the fish like this. And up at the swivel, after, after the three metres, we've got a 32-ounce sinker. <clears throat> now this rig we're going to let down slowly because we don't want it to tangle up on the way down. The sinker off the nose of the skip jack will keep it pointing down, but that's what controls the speed we can let it down at. Not, not this way here, this is to make it go down. That's, giving, that's, that's determining the speed at which we can go down. By lowering that down slowly, we can, if we're not getting any reaction of 500 metres or 480 where we're fishing, we can start to go through the water column. So we let it down, we're down 100 metres, 120 metres, 150 metres, keep letting it out until we're two out of 500 metres. Put it on a float, give it a while, sit back, have another drink, bottle of cigarette, have a cup of tea, come out, and go the other way. This guy here, one with the big sinker on, we just slowly wind it up, come back up through those water columns. It gives us a chance to fish through, fish through the region vertically rather than just, just along. And uh, Jerry's the, the 369 kilo fish, uh, that was actually caught in uh, 300 metres of water. So we're using this method, we were letting it down and the fish jumped on at 300. We've actually hooked up, using the method, we've hooked up on fish as close as 25 metres to the surface. That was on the way up, so whether it actually chased it up or followed it up, we don't know. We caught them everywhere from 25 metres 
150 meters, 200 meters, 300 meters, 400 meters, 500 meters, and that's why we're fishing in 500 meters of water. So that's by using the two options, um, it allows us to cover that area. Now what I've got to say to you guys here, <coughs> is that uh, Phil and I, <coughs> that's, that's, that's the Irishman's other name, isn't it, Phil? Yeah. <laughs> one was called Phil and the other one was called Doug, yeah. And um, it's a, with, a, just, with tuna almost a non-event non anymore, it's, it's really affected, I think, the game fishery all around the coast. The great thing about this fishery is it's something that's out there, it's been out there all the time, but we've never taken particularly great advantage of it. It started to happen a lot of action up at the garden patch where we've been fishing, guys have tweaked on, guys are coming up and doing a lot of fishing up there. But you only have to take one look at your barometric chart out here, and you guys should be the centre of broad billing in the whole of New Zealand. You've got all the perfect ingredients. What we're looking for is the opportunity for the fish to get to 700, 800, 900, 1,000 metres during the daytime. We're looking for areas where they're fishable, where they're in reasonable range. We can fish them in 600, 500 metres. We're looking for areas where there are accumulations of blue nose because that's where the broad bull will gather when they come off with their pelagic lifestyle or their, their transmission lifestyle and they start to take up station. We're looking for places that are reasonably close to shore. <coughs> And we're looking for places where you're not going to fall, be falling over each other because there's only two or three places to go. This year on the garden patch, when we're fishing this method, we had as many as 15 other boats around us. <clears throat> Just because there are not the range of places where we can get those facilities on the east coast, north of, uh, um, north of Cape Breck. Out here, you've got lots and lots of places to do it. You know the Brawl are here. You know the blue nose are here. You should be out there doing it. Questions? I didn't, I didn't realise I made it so clear. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, um, when you got the gear down and the fish are taped, what sort of drag setting are you, you going to let the <coughs> fish just take away with it? Or are you. <coughs> I've, got uh, a yeah, I've got a float there. Okay, <clears throat> he's taking the, the float down, or else the float's coming up, or um, he's taking the float down, the rubber band's broken off and he's, he's swimming away with it. Now in just about all the cases, the 500 metres of line, what I'm doing at my end is irrelevant when I've got nylon out there. So, um, and because while we were adjusting the boat, we've got in reverse, we're adjusting the boat, we've got one, perhaps two floats out there, we're adjusting the position of the boat all the time, my reels and free spool while I'm trying to... I'm more concerned about where the float is in relation to the back of the boat than I am about what's happening between my reel and the fish at that point in time. As soon as we start to wind in and we've got weight, we're up to us with fishing 12 kgs of drag, might go to 10 kgs of drag on the way up, in case the fish decides it's going to have a, a run halfway up. Um, as soon as we've got it up, we're up to 12 kgs of drag. As soon as we've got 400 metres of line back out again, we're up to 10 kgs of drag, back to 10 kgs of drag. So, but on, on the take, um, yeah, just, just start winding, basically, because the fish will be swimming towards you. Yeah, fine. Um, and another thing you talked about with wind-on leaders, there's lots of stories that a lot of fish have lost in the boat for them. The, the hook pulls easily. Um, the wind on leader, you can actually, well, you tell me what, the, you actually, getting the fish close to the boat, we can get a gap into it with some guy swinging on the trace and pulling the hook out. Yeah, the, you know, if, you, if you've got a 30 foot trace and you've got somebody, especially somebody brave and strong, starts grabbing the leader before you can actually see how securely the hook is in the fish. Um, and because these, lots of these fish are foul hooked anyway, they'll, uh, they'll pull the hooks from the fish. And one of the advantages of the wind on leader, of course, is that uh, you do, you, you're playing the fish right up to within uh, sight and within gaffing distance almost, or within tagging distance. 
that, and that always appeals to me a bit while I'm going leaders as well. That, that's, that's the point, wasn't it? That was, Thanks for your talk tonight. Uh, just wondering about uh, water temperatures. Have you got any ideas on that? Um, well, the thing is that the, the, soils, are, the soils are here, um, basically from uh, Christmas through to now. They start to move up now. Uh, September, they start moving up into 27 degree water uh, for spawning. We don't, they don't spawn in our waters. They come down here to feed, the same as the striped marlin do, and head north to spawn. Fortunately, they do it a lot later to give us an extended season for broadbill. The reality is, when you're fishing your 500 metres, um, it's the sea life down there that counts, not the not water temperature on the surface. Um, if, you've got, if you've got the blue nose down there, and, and there's been swords in the area, um, it's most likely the swords are still going to be hanging around looking for a big blue nose. So water temp, and it's the same with the moon. Um, you know, people say, oh, I'm only going fishing on the blue moon. My personal opinion is that you're going to go fishing when it's calm. <laughs> Now, guys will tell you whether you'll catch a you'll catch a male fish on the rising moon and a female fish on the waning moon. Frankly, I don't even care what sex it is. I just want to catch it. <laughs> you, Jeff. Thanks very much. It's interesting. Um, speed of drift. Does that matter? Well, it's governed by your balloon. Uh, if you've got a low current, your balloon is going to get or your, your float is going to be, you, you'll see your float going like this and the water backing up just like a, 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 a marker in the channel here and you'll see the water backing up on it. If you've got a lot of current, you may not be getting right to the bottom. You may be right at the bottom because that current may only be on the top. Uh, what you do know is that uh, if it breaks free, if you've got a lot of current and you're in your balloons on this angle and, and trotting along in a current, you know that that, uh, um, that sinker is going to, that, that, that bait's going to get pulled to this, pulled away from where the fish is feeding pretty quickly. Uh, and, and my suggestions in those circumstances are either to fish with more weight with the secondary weight, perhaps go up to three of these guys to keep it in the area a bit longer, or shift somewhere else. I must say that these areas we're fishing in, uh, we're fishing, you might have a tide line come through, but um, it's not general that uh, in our area that we'll get uh, a, a, a two knot current develop for uh, a, a, a two mile band of, uh, across the sea. Normally the, these currents are pretty um, narrow and, and constrained to uh, quite, quite small channels in the ocean. So uh, mostly, you know, up, up the garden patch we've got perhaps four areas where we know there's blue nose accumulations where we've had a history of catching um, swords and when I get that problem I'll just shift somewhere else along the, the garden patch to one of the other posies. If it's, if it's really strong, if you've got a really strong current you can't get away from it, you might have to go to what Florida does and, and have these modified ledger rigs where the, the bait floats out sideways from the sinker rather than being in parallel like mine are. And definitely, we, we, fished, we fished this method up the uh, bottom end of the king bank a couple of times when it's um, been quite quite calm. But most of the time, if you try to use this up the king bank, there's just too much current there. Yeah, yeah. It must have been very erudite and informational because nobody's got any more questions. So we basically just drift around and don't move along any speed? Well, we're, we're governed by these guys. Yeah. Yeah, these, these are in the water, yeah. so wherever the boat goes, the boat follows in reverse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 What current there is. And I say, up the garden patch, you know, we've got a knot of current up the garden patch, that's a lot of current. Uh, most of the time we're talking half a knot, a quarter of a lot of current. No, dead calm, you don't like to see it along, Yeah, again, but sometimes it will still move uh, when it's dead calm, because of the sea currents, but uh, yeah, just when it's dead calm, and you know, I, I sit back and relax and hope we don't hook up on a fish because I'm enjoying it because it's dead calm. 
pretty hard work once you hook up on a fish and you've got to drive the boat and the bugger might be sitting there for eight hours doing nothing, eh? Hey, Jeff, um, what's your, over here, out the back? The other way. Yeah, hey, there he is. You, you might have seen this, I'd get a bit um, deaf for a few quarts, but um, what's, your, what's your take on circles versus J-hooks? <clears throat> the reason I'm using um, the J-hooks is because I want the hook down deep. Um, I'm not really into uh, uh, worrying about whether I'm going to tag and reach the fish when I hook up on a whirlpool. And uh, because we're looking at 50% of the fish foul hooking themselves, um, it's uh, um, that, that big bite out of one of these guys in the bottom of a petrol fin or something, I like that sitting in there. No reason, no reason you shouldn't use circle hooks. The problem I've got with the circle hooks, I want to, I want to use a big bait. I one think one of the things I didn't cover, thanks. Um, if I use a squid, we caught, we caught, uh, we caught them, the, we caught swords on squid, we caught them on kohiru as baits. The problem with those smaller baits is they'll get attacked by the blue nose and the, and the gem fish and everything else. This big bait here, especially with the blue nose, he won't, the blue nose won't get that down. Quite often we'll see the skippy come up and it's got mouth marks about this far up, but he can't, and especially with the J-hook sitting out here with this rig, he can't get that down. So he, he's, the, the, it'll, it'll survive in amongst the blue nose um, a lot longer than the smaller bait on a circle hook would. Um, so when, I, when, I'm, when I'm live baiting for marlin, generally I'm using 20 burrow circles with it. It's the old adage, big hook. Well, as I said, we've got, we've got these rigs um, made up here. Um, guys can come up and have a look after them, don't worry. And uh, I'll be hanging around, probably having another beer or another gin or something, and uh, just feel free to give us a question. We've got some cards here. If you want to grab a card and you want to email me with any questions at any time, um, feel free to just give us an email. We'll give you as much information as we can. Um, I'm not one of those people that believes that when you uh, find something out about fishing, you should keep it secret. I think when you get some information, the best thing you can do is share it with your mates. And you might have more mates once you do share it because uh, <coughs> they appreciate what you've done. But to me, the idea of this fishery out here is it's something we should all be taking advantage of. Uh, for a long time, it was looked upon as a purely commercial fishery because the recreational fishers weren't going out and putting the effort in. The only way we can claim a portion of that back and make it uh, quite obvious that it is a recreational fishery is for more of us to go out there, more of us to start doing it, more of us to be successful at it, more of us to convince our mates to come out, more of us to convince tourists to come out and do it. And you guys here have got a base from which I think broadbill could be just as useful to you as a fish source as the bluefin are of the brogan.